Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Start at your eight minutes. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Chairperson Moore, as well as the California Reparations Task Force for inviting me here to speak on my favorite subject today. I also want to thank uh, Alicia Turner for the grunt work she has done, but more importantly, I want to thank Dr. Cheryl Grills for suggesting genealogists address the challenge of tracing African Americans into slavery. I don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you the 40,000 foot view of proving slave ancestry. Next. Genealogy is based on evidence. It's very similar to a court of law where a person dies without an estate. People have to bring in evidence to prove who's related to the deceased and how they're related to the deceased. And those rules in a court are very similar to the rules that we use in genealogy. We're trying to prove two things. The first thing we're trying to prove is identity. Is this our ancestor? or is it merely someone with the same name as our ancestor? And when you look in these databases, they have thousands and thousands of names and many people with the same name. The other thing we're trying to prove is relationship. Is this your ancestor? And is this the person's father? Is this the person's mother? And do they have documentary evidence to prove that? So that's what we're trying to prove in genealogy. Next slide. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to start with ourselves and proceed back with one generation at a time to take us back to slavery 157 years ago. So that's 157 years of research that we must do to get back to slavery. We're talking about looking at oral history. No, could you go? All right, stay there. Thank you. Uh, we're looking at oral history. We're looking at obituaries. We're looking at birth certificates, death certificates census records, court records, church records, military records, and a multitude of other records. Next. We cannot assume who the slave owner was or who the enslaver was, because again, this is based on evidence. So we need evidence to prove who that person was. I was a consultant on the Reverend Al Sharpton's genealogy back in 2007. Al Sharpton's great-grandfather, Coleman Sharpton, was enslaved in Liberty County, Florida. Next slide. This is an illustration of the 1860 Liberty County, Florida slave schedule. The census schedules that were taken every 10 years. When you get to 1850 and 1860, they had slave schedules. But on that slave schedule, you find the name of the enslaver, but there are no names of enslaved people on there. There's only their ages, their sex, and their color. So the genealogist working on this said that this Jefferson Sharpton was Coleman's enslaver. I said without names on those slave schedules, you cannot prove who was enslaved. The slave schedules do not prove ownership. So the genealogist did further research. Jefferson Sharpton died shortly after the slave schedule was created, leaving debts. His father, Alexander Sharpton, lived in Edgefield, South Carolina. Alexander sent five of his enslaved people, including Coleman, to Florida to be hired out to pay off his son's debts. Next slide. This is the 1861 indenture for that transaction and proof that Alexander Sharpton was the owner and not Jefferson Sharpton. I also told the genealogist that segregationist Senator Strom Thurmond was also from Edgefield, South Carolina. The genealogist did more research and learned that Sharpton's ancestors were enslaved by Strom Thurmond's ancestors. This moved the story from page five to page one in the New York Daily News for five days in a row. It was the most read story on the internet. I was quoted in seven different newspapers around the world. This is what happens when we use evidence to prove genealogy. So what kind of evidence are we talking about? Next slide, please. Next slide. We're talking about things like 
slave narratives. Those were interviews done with formerly enslaved people. Here, Alex Woodard was owned by Johnny Simulton. Next slide. We can use Civil War pension files. Over 170,000 African Americans fought in the U.S. Civil War in the U.S. Colored Troops. Here, Thomas Upshaw had a pension application file and indicated that his mother was owned by Lewis Upshaw, but his dad was, was owned by another enslaver named Nelson. Next slide, please. The Freedmen's Bureau, which uh, Dr. Hollis Gentry mentioned earlier. The Freedmen's Bureau was a social service agency after the Civil War and had about a dozen different services for freedmen as well as refugees. Here is an 1866 labor contract where Samuel Littlejohn hired three men who he indicates that he formerly enslaved. Next slide. This is a Freedman Bank record. The Freedman's Bank, the Freedman Savings and Trust Association was a banking system after the Civil War for formerly enslaved people, as well as Civil War veterans. Here we have Thomas Armstrong said his master was William McIntosh. Next slide, please. Here we have manumission records. A manumission was when an owner or enslaver individually privately frees some of his enslaved individuals. These are found in the courthouse. These are only a few of the dozen other records that prove enslavement. Next slide. So we have many challenges. Next, what are some of the challenges? One, there's faulty oral history. We have stories that are passed down from generation to generation, and oftentimes they get changed in each generation. Next, most records are not online. The internet only has a tip of the iceberg of the billions of records that exist, and most people are not even aware of those records. Next, names of formerly enslaved people are often different than those of their last owner. They have a name of an owner, but it could go back generation. Next slide. Some people change their name. Some of them didn't, but some of them did, particularly those that were on the Underground Railroad to protect their identity. Next. Many names were spelled in many different ways. I found my name Burl spelled over 20 different ways. That's a real challenge in tracing your ancestors. Next. Some records did not survive. There were born courthouses, which was mentioned earlier. There were records that were thrown out, and there's records that were transferred, records that have been sitting in warehouses, and sometimes records are just hidden from view that people do not have access to. Next. This is not quick and easy research. It can be very laborious and very time consuming. Next slide. Genealogy is easy to start, but it's difficult to prove enslaved ancestors. Next slide. Unfortunately, most people do not have the genealogical skills and the knowledge of history to prove slave ancestry. Next slide. Thank you very much. I appreciate you offering me the opportunity to present this information. And I'll be more than happy to have any questions that you may have.